um, my name, I'll write it up here because you won't believe it. My name is Brock Jeffries. That is a real name, real first God-given name. So, Brock Jeffries, and we're going to talk about um, foundation repair, foundation issues, things that you guys see. Uh, any home inspectors in here at all? No, everybody's realtors. Okay, very good. Um, so we'll go through this. It'll be pretty elementary at first, pretty uh, basic. Might even be boring for a couple minutes because we know everybody's on different levels as far as their understanding of foundations. And so as we get going, it'll catch up to speed. You guys will, hopefully you'll enjoy it. So, um, so we're gonna talk about different types of foundations. Um, what are some different types of foundations that we see out there when they build a home? Building a home, typically we see cement. Yeah, cement or concrete, right? Um, anyone from the Midwest? Typically in the Midwest, even still, even today, we have a lot of cinder block foundations, right? Um, what other types might we see out here? Rock, concrete, cinder block, rock. Okay, where do we see those? In view here. Old homes. Maybe Sugar House, Avenues, some of these old homes in downtown Arkham. And then brick, pretty uncommon, but it's on there. Um, so we'll just go through this real quickly. A concrete foundation, we've all seen this, right? We're driving through a neighborhood. You can tell they're building a new home and they're just, they're pouring concrete to form up a brand new foundation, right? Everybody seen this? Anybody built a new home before, gone through this? Okay. So most common. Someone flushed the toilet up there or something. Uh, cinder block foundation. We see not as not as often. Uh, some older homes, probably pre 1980. Sometimes you see that. Um, usually, uh, people will do that because of cost to make the build a little bit uh, less expensive. Brick foundation. A lot of times this brick, similar to rock, will have uh, like mortar over the top of it or like a, a skim coat so you don't really know that it's a brick foundation. And then rock, this one especially. So you're in these older areas, downtown Ogden area, um, some of these areas like uh, Sugar House, you don't usually see this, you usually see plaster over the top of it. It's not until you go down into the basement that you realize it's a rock foundation, right? It's got rock footings, rock foundation. So, um, going back to those four that we just talked about, why is this important? Does it make a difference? You're helping a buyer, you're helping a seller buy a home. Does it make a difference if the home is cinder block, concrete, rock? Does it change any value or anything like that? Useful life, maybe. Yeah, yeah, like from an appraisal standpoint, what's the useful life of the foundation? So I'll tell you a story. I was in Bluffdale, and we're looking at this house that had, had all sorts of water coming in. Brand new home, equestrian lot, three, four acre lot, $500,000 home, and uh, go down to the basement. Basement's unfinished, but they had wrapped all the walls with insulation. And there's water coming through, like all over. And we're just puzzled because this is a new home. But Bluffdale, I mean, it, it does have some water table issues. Um, so I pulled back the insulation and found out the home, brand new home, all cinder block. Okay? You know, <clears throat> does it make a difference? I mean, it certainly does. Um, and it turns out the person that built the home had done that because of their background and they were able to acquire the cinder block at a cheap price. They built this brand new house, all cinder block foundation. So these things make a difference, especially when we start talking about waterproofing and settling um, and foundations that have bone walls. So yeah, uh, definitely, you know, concrete is 
what most homes are built out of. What, like I said, if you are in the Midwest, you'll see a lot of cinder block still. Um, what is a footing? Any, any idea what a footing is when you build a house? What, what footing might be support useful? Support for the walls. Who said that? Support for the walls. Yeah. So support, not only the walls, but probably support for the entire structure, yeah. right? So the footing underneath the foundation is going to bear the weight of the entire structure of the home. And so, <clears throat> I won't necessarily read through this, but it's there. Um, the footing of the home carries the entire weight of the structure. And so the soil under that footing is what we want to consider for sure. Mm -hmm. We don't just build on anything, right? First step when we're building a home, we dig a hole. And a lot, of, a lot of prep is going to go into that soil, depending on what we're building on. We can build on sand, we can build on, you know, on rock, or whatever we build on. We're going to want to make sure that the soil underneath that footing can bear the weight of the structure. And we'll talk more about that. Anybody heard of a shelf basement? A few hands. What is, what's a shelf basement? Why does it exist? Or, Anybody sold a home or helped someone buy a home that has a shelf basement? Or any of your homes maybe have a shelf basement? Doesn't everybody want to live in Sugar House now? Right? <laughs> they love these 100-year-old homes. Why, what does it do? Any ideas? Access, maybe? Yeah, access? Typically, I think most of them are places where the basement wasn't there and somebody went in and dug them out. Bingo, right? Mm -hmm. Hit it right on the head. Just Perfect, so we'll let's draw a little picture, get some illustrations going. All right, so we've got our home, right? And we're, let's say, 1910, sooner, right? It'll be a lot sooner. So here's our lovely home, and we've got our soil. We've got some footings underneath here, but we don't have a basement, okay? And so we build this home, and then a few years down the road, we say, we need some extra storage there, right? Whoever Jedediah says to Maria or whatever. And so there isn't a footing, on, there isn't a basement. And so what do they do is they've got all this dirt here, and then they start digging it out like this. But they leave soil around the perimeter. Why do they leave the soil around the perimeter? Support the foundation. Yeah, support the house. Hence, a shelf, right? So you've got the foundation here. Inside this, this uh, dirt shelf is the footing of the home. So is that, if I start peeling this dirt away, the closer I get to the foundation, the more susceptible that home is to losing, or the soil, to losing its bearing capacity, to losing its ability to bear weight. And so we want to be careful. If we just start peeling all that dirt away, all of a sudden that house isn't going to have anything to sit on. So they'll leave a shelf in place to hold up the house, and that's what a shelf basement is, right? Now, if you've helped people buy or sell these homes, what do they always ask? When you, make, when you take out a shelf and put a nice... 10 foot basement down there, right? Don't they always ask that? And so, yes and no. I mean, yeah, you can. With engineering, you can remove this, but we want to make sure that there is something that's going to bear the weight of the structure. We don't just tear it out and uh, hope it stands. So you want to be careful on those. But it's good for you guys to know so that when you go and you see these homes, you understand okay, well, these are things that we can do or we can't do. Shelf basement, people will call it shelf foundation. So it really is the bearing structure, the strata, the soil that continues to hold up the house. So, all right, I think that's mostly kind of the boring stuff. So everybody's going to be kind of caught up to speed. So what causes a home to sink, settle, or sag? Nobody's had a home that's ever had any of these issues, right? You've never had a home that's maybe had foundation cracks or something. Or a water table gets to be a big one. That's a good one. We will definitely talk about that. What did you say? I think the water. He took yours? Issue. He yeah. took okay. Anybody else? No? Soil not caught back in proper. Correct, right? They build. What do we all love? We all love walkout basements, 
right? And so just a few blocks from here, we've got all these homes that are built on this massive hill, right? <laughs> so we've got this big, massive hill here. And so we build front door, right? There's kind of the driveway, we fill this in. And then we've got the back that walks out. We've got this footing that goes way, way down. Well, we don't want it to go way, way down. So what we do with this hill is we bring in a bunch of dirt like that, right? And so we build on top of that. And we've got our house here. We walk in, ground level, go downstairs, and we walk out on a walk-out basement, right? You've all seen it where you walk out. You don't have to come upstairs. And so a lot of times a walkout basement will have fill dirt that was brought in so that they can walk out, right? It's built on a hill. So they bring in that fill dirt. Well, that's fine, you know, that, there's no issue with that. But if I don't compact that fill dirt very well, if I just throw it down and just kind of compact it, there's a possibility that that fill dirt can collapse. When water is added, it will lose its bearing capacity that won't be able to bear up the house, right? And so we want to be careful that, so that's one reason that we cause a home to sink, settle, or, or sag. What was the other one you mentioned? Oh, water table, right? What are some other reasons maybe? Type of soil? Yeah, very good. Type of soil, um, what type of soil do we have throughout Utah? Clay. Clay, right? Um, if you go down to southern Utah, you start hearing of some blue clay. Anybody heard of blue clay, heard that term before? Okay. Um, but is it the soil? It kind of is, it is, but there's kind of a trick to it. We've all been to the beach, right? No? Okay, so we've all been to the beach. And I used to do this fun example, and I, I need to do it, right? Because I've talked about it in every class, and I never do it. So you know those big Tupperware bins that your wife has, or your spouse, or whoever, or you ladies have your shoes in underneath the bed? Big Tupperware. So what we used to do, we'd fill that with sand, right? Even compact the sand, or however much you can compact sand. And then we'd put a big cinder block on it, okay? Kind of move it and shake it. It really wouldn't do much until we started adding, we'd start pouring water on it. You pour water on it and you start seeing this block, it starts to move. Because water is gonna be the main catalyst for everything that we're talking about. For that walkout basement that's built on soil that wasn't compacted, water is what breaks it down, right? Or, um, you know, that, that brick sitting there in the cinder block, when we add the water, it loses that bearing capacity. Or the beach example, right? You're standing there, right? You're in Cancun or Mazatlan or Hawaii. You've got this water washing over your toes. You're not doing anything, but what's happening? You're sinking, right? Your feet start getting stuck in the sand. and So the water is the catalyst. Water is what causes a lot of issues. Even on homes that have compacted proper soil, enough water, will cause them to sink or settle, right? We've, we've all seen, you know, zigzagging cracks in brick. Sometimes you go through a neighborhood and you don't see it, but you see one house that does, and maybe that's a downspout that's dumping water in the corner of this home, and just too much water is gonna cause that problem. Um, the water table, here's our house again. Let's say, let's say we have a basement, right? Third, third, front door. This is our basement. Does this make sense? <coughs> House, basement, okay? So let's say we live in um, Harrisville. A lot of water, right? So we've got our water table, and let's say it's, it's down 10 feet. If it rains a lot, maybe we have a year like we had 2011 or so, that water table can rise and all of this soil that's underneath these footings can get saturated and lose its bearing capacity, okay? So water table can definitely play a role as well. You may live in a home for 20, 30 years and not have any problems. One year, we get a lot of water and it starts to sink or settle. So nobody's ever sold a home that had issues? Yeah. You guys have 
get me sell homes here, right? <laughs> so soil, that was mentioned. Soil you, your home is built on can play a huge part as to whether you will face foundation issues down the road. Not necessarily the soil, but how the soil reacts when exposed to high amounts of water. Okay. Yes. I had a house in, in Dallas, uh, and Dallas is, has clay, yeah. but it's the kind of clay that when you wet it, it expands. Yes, okay. And uh, I had to water my foundation. I'd never heard of having to yes. water my foundation, but that's exactly why. Yeah, like sprinklers that are on year yeah. round, right? That keep it saturated. And, and right around the house. Yes, yes. Because if it if it dried or partially dried, yeah. then you'd have the cracks in the brick. Yeah. So you're my white whale, because in another class somebody said that it's been three years. But it, it exists, yeah. The, so they have to water the foundation to keep it saturated because if it starts to dry out, it'll start to expand as that soil takes on all that water. And so you won't necessarily won't have to deal with that, but in St. George they deal with it all the time. It's, uh, it's called bentonite or caliche soil or blue clay. And so in St. George, when some of that soil gets really wet, it'll actually expand. They said you could, you could uh, take a pipe, and a galvanized pipe, and put caps on the ends of it, mm -hmm. and drill a little hole, and drip water in there, and that yeah. stuff had so much power that it would burst that burst pipe. pipe. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they deal with that in St. George. It's a different class. We teach a different class down there. So, but yeah, very true. Um, you've seen this before, right? You go out to the desert, and you can see after the soil has started to dry out, it shrinks, right? Or it takes on a little bit different life. So it's not necessarily right when it gets wet, but sometimes it's after it gets wet and how it reacts after that. So look familiar, right? Seen it out in the desert. Ron, I was just wondering, uh, back on this other issue of too much water, how effective is a sump pump to avoid soil erosion? Very, very, very well, soil erosion, um, I don't know the answer, and I don't know if there's anything that can be done because it's still getting wet, you're almost pumping it out after the fact, right? Is this a... I don't know, I'm just curious, because I see a lot of houses with sump pumps, yeah. I'm just wondering if over time there, there could be potential issues there. Yeah, there, there can be, um, and we will get into that. Uh, is everybody here for two hours? Yes, sir. Okay, well, I'll, I'll keep it entertaining, I promise. <laughs> so there's two classes. This one deals with the foundation issues. The other one deals with water and drainage. So we'll kind of break for five or seven minutes right in the middle, and, and then we'll talk about all the water and drainage stuff. So any other questions on that? But yeah, sump pumps, you know, I. I don't know. I don't know the, the actual answer. Maybe it's too late sometimes because water's there and then we're pumping it out. Um, really what we're doing is we're trying to keep that water table below the house. That's why the pump is there. Because the water table will rise and want to come into the basement and the pump is pumping that water out before it comes into the basement, hopefully. Right? So. Um, so soil throughout Utah. We, talk, we said most of it is what? It's clay. Are there areas in Utah that should be noted? Areas that might be different or areas when you have been selling or helping people buy homes that are of concern? Any thoughts? Oh, the rocks in North Austin. Yeah, a bunch of those big school bus sized boulders, right? Did that used to be, I don't know, does anybody know, does that used to be a landfill as well? I've, I've had somebody in another class that was mentioned at one point. Um, that is an area to be noted for, for some settling, and it is on our list here. These aren't in any particular order. Um, the Cedar Hills, we all know, you know where Cedar Hills is? Anybody help anyone by yourself? You guys, probably, everybody stays pretty much here, right? I'm behind Alpine. Yeah, exactly, They're right up against the bench there. So Cedar Hills, a lot of issues there. Saratoga Springs, a lot of issues, right? North Ogden, right? A lot of issues. Um, Sugar House, you know, and that one could be soil, could be old homes, could be water. Uh, we're talking about the, you know, so when we're thinking about those older homes, 
And we have this in some of those not so great areas in Ogden, right? Some of these really old homes and they're really close to each other. Is that offensive? No. No? Okay. So we've got a home here. Okay. And we've got, yes, it is offensive. And then we've got soil. And then we've got another home. Footings, footings. And so, I mean, between these two, sometimes we've got, what, 12 feet? A driveway? You've seen it? If that? Yeah, if that. We also have a shallow footing, which is a shelf basement, right? We've also got poor drainage, typically. If they're old, there's no rain gutters here. And so we've got kind of this perfect storm of an old home. It could be a rock foundation, okay? Weak footing. Could be uh, too close to the neighbor where it's just got poor drainage. Nowhere for that water to go. You've got a shallow footing where water can just get underneath here and saturate the shelf, right? Or saturate the bearing soil underneath the foundation and cause an issue. So see that a lot. We've kind of been driving through Sugar House before and you see all these bungalow porches falling apart, right? Yeah. You've seen it. And so, I mean, a lot of it's age. They're 100 years old. A lot of it is, um, you know, proximity to their neighbors. There's really not a, a very good drainage plan. They've got a shallow footing, and so it's, it's kind of the perfect storm sometimes when you get into Sugar House or some of these older areas. Provo Bench, similar issues there than we have in Cedar Hills. Um, and Vernal, too. For whatever reason, we've got some really bad soil out there. A lot of homes like to sell out there. So some signs that we might see. Zigzagging in the brick. Vertical cracking in the foundation wall. Anybody seen this before? No stories? I'm gonna need stories. We're gonna burn through this real quick. So, um, I was just wondering, in North Ogden, could some of the soil issues be, because there's a lot of underground streams. Yes. Out there. Is that where that's coming from? Yes, yep. Okay. So exactly. You know, if we can, so the sand, the, the box of sand with the cinder block, if we keep it dry, there's two things that can, can make that sink. One is seismic activity, right? The other would be water. So adding the water. So, I mean, if you just stand here forever, there's nothing that's going to move you unless you start pouring water underneath your feet or unless there's seismic movement. So really, you know, even poor, poor soil, if we add water to it, it's going to, some will be more susceptible than others. Some you have to do, you know, like in Dallas, you've got to be really careful. You know, and like St. George, you've got to be really careful. Um, some of these areas, Cedar Hills, you've got to be really, really careful on your watering, all your drainage to make sure that you're not creating an issue that wouldn't, wouldn't exist if, if you're responsible with the water. So a question for you. I mean, obviously on the footings, we're trying to get below the frost line. We're trying to get smooth soil. Sure. But soil being problem in and of itself with water being a challenge. Mm -hmm. So what can you do? Well, you can extend your downspouts, right? So I mean, diversion of water makes yes. sense, but nothing sub-terrain can be um, Well, yeah, we'll talk about that, like piers, helical piers or push piers, or um, essentially putting your house on stilts to where it looks like it's resting on the soil, but it's really resting on bedrock that's 20, 30 feet below the soil. That can be done as well. St. George selects to make a blue clay and bring in you know, non-native fill. Yeah, mm -hmm. bring in like a non-native fill. So they're removing the problem. Sometimes, I mean, those piers, you know, sometimes in the sugar house, we're going down, and in Ogden, we go down 150 feet before we hit anything that's remotely bearing sort of weight. So sometimes it's not cost effective, sometimes it is. St. George has got a lot of rock, but then we just got this layer of blue clay, so easy to bypass. Um, cost effective, but yeah, to, funny enough though, I mean, when you ask that, diverting water down spouts, that is just, you know, that will save a lot. It can keep water away from homes. You're landscaping so that you've got a negative grade, so all that water is running away from the house. That's exactly, those are things that will prevent a lot of issues. Um, who said they built a new home? First year, did you have nail pops? Little things popping? Doors that weren't the same as when you moved yeah. in. Yeah. And it happens, right? I mean, you, we put a lot of weight on something that wasn't holding that weight before. 
And so the home will kind of relax into place. But if you have an ongoing issue, then you'll see at year three, four, five, usually the first two years, you'll see that a lot of that little relaxation. If people get nervous, they call the builder. The builder comes and patches all the nail pops and stuff. But, um, but yeah, I mean, if you have ongoing issues, you're gonna know after the fact. You know, I've, I've got nail pops every year, and every year I'm having to patch it. Well, there's probably an issue there that needs to be addressed. So, these are some common signs. Um, a lot of people will go down into the basement and they'll see cracks in the basement slab, right? Would that be a, maybe an issue? No, generally not. Yeah, generally not. A lot of people think that's their foundation. That's not the foundation. Those are cosmetic cracks, and um, you see them a lot. Sometimes it's an issue, sometimes it's not. But I mean, the question is, is it is it telling a story? You know, so if you Let's say you're in that basement and you see a bunch of cracks on the floor and you say, honey, these are getting really wide. I don't know, do we have an issue here? What might be some other things that, that we might see down there? Water coming up. Yeah, maybe water coming up. Um, what about, <clears throat> actually, I think some of these pictures might be, you can see this, I mean, stucco will stretch quite a bit. Some of that zigzagging, you can see that it's it's been sealed, it's opened up, they've sealed it again, it's opened again. Um, I think we got some pictures here. Garage door that doesn't shut, maybe. You seen that? It's kind of got like a little like smiley face. Where both sides, um, like right here, it doesn't really shut all the way. This is on the inside. So homes that are actually built before 1987 will have this issue. The building, and not exactly that year, but the building code did change in 87. And so, just to give you a little visual, here's our house, here's our garage, got our little man door off to the side. We've got our garage door here, front door of the house, driveway, Okay, so pre-1987, this was almost a aerial view of the footing of a home, right? Footing in the same spot where the house is gonna be built. Well, this corner right here, from where the man door is to where the garage starts would break and it would crack. And when it would sink like that, the garage door doesn't shut like it normally would. And so now, as the building code has changed, this is all attached, one footing underground to make sure that doesn't happen anymore. Okay, so you'll see that a lot, and usually the home is pre-1987 when you see that. Building code fixed a lot of that, but yeah, before it was like textbook. You would just see that little corner, mainly the, the corner that at the end of the house that was causing a lot of problems for people. So, so what changed, like some of these really old homes, they're just built so solid, some of them I don't even see any cracks, yeah. they look great. So what happened with the quality of construction in some of these old, real old homes? Because um, a lot of newer ones that I've seen, yeah. there's a lot of these issues. Yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of answers for that. Some new homes, first of all, we're building in areas that, like if you think of Cedar Hills, a lot of that neighborhood didn't even exist pre-1987. Pre you know, when we had this big real estate boom, 2005, six, seven, whole neighborhoods are just being thrown up and we're building and whatever the municipality is or whatever the city is, sometimes they're not requiring any soil testing. We build the home and then it starts to sink. We don't know two, three years later. You know, in fairness, in fairness to the builder, sometimes nobody knew and then a few years down the road it started to cause problems. Or, um, you know, sometimes wide, some old homes have really wide footings, not as cost effective. Some people don't like to do that. Sometimes people did a really good job at compacting the soil underneath the footing, or they over excavated and they, they brought those footings even lower. Um, there's a number of reasons. But yeah, I mean, now we've got so many builders. We've got all our, our ivories and all these builders that just throw homes up and you know, they're not necessarily, some of them don't, don't do any testing, some of them do, but 
I don't know. I don't know if there's one real answer, but you can see a lot of a lot of there's a lot of builders that are out of business. A lot of builders that built homes really quickly and uh, didn't do any soil testing. There's a lot of cities that didn't require it then, and now they require it because they realize they have huge problems. Like Saratoga Springs, a lot of homes were built 2004, five, six, seven, thousands of homes were built, and then they settled, or some of them settled, and then they said, well, we've got to take some more measures and do some different things to make sure these homes don't continue to settle. And so they, you know, they require gravel and all this stuff. I don't know that it helps, but they're they're trying. They require before you build a home, you have to have soil testing. And so sometimes people were diligent and others weren't. So like sagging floors, nail pops, cracks in the corners of doors and windows, textbook signs and foundation issues. So that's, um, to, to go back and answer that question about the cracks in the floor, right? Everybody's scared, especially you've got your buyers. They're, they're trying to buy a house. They want to make sure they don't have any issues. And so they see these cracks in the floor. They may look larger than, than normal. Um, what do we do? How do we know? You know, we're going to find some other compensating factors that are going to lead us to believe that there is a problem. If we just see one little issue, well, there may not be a problem. But let's say we've got cracks in the floor of, where's our house still? The basement, there's some cracks throughout the floor, you know. But at the same time, let's say the front door doesn't open or close like it should. Or we've got nail pops that are coming back. Or there's uh, cracks that have, like corners of doors that have been patched. A lot of this stuff you won't ever see because the seller will try to hide it, right? No? <laughs> they, I don't think they, one has ever done that before. They thought about it, maybe. Let's see. So yeah, I mean, this is pretty typical here. Sometimes you'll see some separation um, right where you know some of the molding is supposed to join together. Cracking, door won't open or shut like it should. Sliding door is a little out of whack here. Can cause some issues. Um, let's see here. So some solutions. What are some ways to fix this? You guys have never had the problem, so no one's ever thought about how to fix it, right? So what are some, is there any, anything that can be done? Any ideas? We talked about peers. Yeah. Anybody dealt with piers that have been installed on their house? No? There's okay. one right now for sale at about 27. And they have a, an engineer's report attached. It says there are 17 reinforcements or leveling things hmm. in there where no one can see. And just even seeing that spooked my buyers. You know, <coughs> it may have been actually leveling it, but the floor on the main level, yeah, and it was wood, so it yeah. was really obvious. It yeah. was either the gloss or it was just board polish. Yeah. Okay, 27? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's some issues there. I mean, it, Ogden is weird. That Ogden bench can be weird, right? You get a lot of water. There's a lot of sump pumps if you go, especially if you go up above Harrison. Some of those homes just have some weird water issues. I think a lot of that water that's just running down the mountain is filling up into these people's basements. We'll talk about that. That's a, that's part two coming up. So yeah, so here's one solution. I don't know that it's the most cost effective. I'm gonna fall off the stage here. I'm alive in the group. Maybe I should stage it and really get some laughs going here. So this, I don't know that this is the cheapest or easiest way to fix a foundation. They've propped it up. They've got some wood, some I beams under there, and they're just re pouring this whole foundation, right? That's one solution. Um, there's these cement pillars that are kind of old school where people would just pound those down into the dirt and build on top of those or pound them down underneath a structure to kind of gain some sort of uh, you know, stabilization. I don't know that that's the best way either. So that little rocking thing kind of keeps people on their toes. We like it. <laughs> See it? So. so 
So peers were brought up. Helical peers. Anybody heard of that one? Yeah. Push peers. That problem in Dallas, that there was companies, pretty large companies that uh, drove those helical peers. I think that's the way they, Yeah. anytime you have that cracking in the, yeah. that's what they'd do is in, in that corner, they'd jack it back up again. Yeah, no, exactly right. So push peers and helical peers, that's the solution. Um, think of one like a screw and one like a nail. One drives in, one screws in. One drives down until it hits some load-bearing strata. That's what we call, some people will call it bedrock. That's the way we, load-bearing strata. We're looking for hard soil there. And this is kind of gives you an example. So two types of ways, um, push peers. So maybe in that report that you had mentioned, 27, they it said that you couldn't see the repairs that were done, right? Something like that. So push peers can actually be done from inside a home, right? So you can go down in that unfinished basement that has all those cracks that's making whoever worry, and we can cut out sections of the concrete and dig underneath. We've got the footing there. We can slide a steel bracket like this one underneath the footing and drive piles in until they hit bedrock. So I think I've got it. Everybody see that? Yeah. So here's our home, here's our footing, right? We can see we're adding water to this. We've got all sorts of different layers of soil. Okay, and so as it rains, as it snows, sometimes that water, this is just one example, sometimes that water table will creep up like that and it saturates all this soil here and can cause settling. Right there. And so it's kind of an extreme example but it gives you an idea. And so when a home settles like this, there's two solutions that are probably the most cost effective and probably the easiest way would be like a, a push pier or a helical pier. And so the way that those are installed, they're, they're kind of similar and kind of not at the same time. So we actually dig down underneath the footing. When you dig down underneath the footing with hydraulics, you can push those piers down into the soil until they hit bedrock, okay? And so they push in just one section at a time, male, female, and push down until they hit bedrock, and then you install another one and another one until that whole effective area has piers under it. And with hydraulics, you can actually lift the structure up back to level. So, so you have a whole bunch of those running at once? So you can see this is installing one at a time. So this little time lapse here will show all of them. So you install one at a time, there's seven there. And after they're installed, you put these hydraulic jacks on top of each one. And with hydraulics, you can lift it back up, just like that. And so the other example, a little bit more invasive, um, but works the same way. Helical piers, which would be using an excavator or a backhoe or a bobcat and a drive head to, with helical or with hydraulics to drive that in and screw that in until it reaches the desired torque. So like I said, one's like a nail, one's like a screw. Um, there's reasons to use one versus the other. We'll, we'll get into that as well. But kind of the same thing goes down until it hits some nice tight soil. You can also lift the structure. A lot of people will say, well, can't you just do one right in the corner? And so this is our, our fun little example, right? Do one in the corner, nothing holding up all the other portions that were settled. So, any questions on that? What's the cost of something like that? It can get expensive. I know there's companies that charge, you know, twelve to sixteen hundred dollars to install those per pier. So that example of like that corner, that corner that we looked at, I think it had um, seven. Was it seven? <coughs> Yeah, so seven times 1500 bucks. Oops. Oops. That's a lot of money. I mean, it can get really expensive. Jim and Cranley was doing a class here yesterday, and he brought in a picture of a guy who, an older gentleman selling his home, and at some point, like 40 or 50 years previous, he had used a heavy duty car.
hard jack. Oh, Tin jack, jack, I mean, jack, yeah. house. And he was mad that when he was selling the house down, he had to correct that properly because he said it had worked for 40 years. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, why should he have to do that? Well, yeah. <laughs> this is in uh, Hurricane, Utah. Not Hurricane, but Hurricane. Hurricane. Um, this is a home that was lifted. This is before it was lifted. This is an orange, right? This is real. No photoshopping or anything. Countertops look like that. <laughs> and gained speed. Well, it doesn't even it doesn't finish there. Like that. Wow. So it's a real one. These are bad. I think it was eleven inches of that house with sun on. So I think the wife was mad that her eggs were rolling off the countertop or something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, they they definitely address <coughs> those issues. Um, you'll probably start seeing them now that you're, you know more about them. Um, how are we on? Is that accurate? Yeah. 18 minutes. Yeah, so push piers, um, ideal for being able to, to install them from the inside of a basement, okay? So if there is a home that's sinking, you can break out that slab in the basement and install piers from inside the basement, smaller machinery. The helical pier, using that big excavator, you're not gonna get that in the basement. Likely, you're gonna to have to tear up a yard to be, let, be, able, to, be able to install those. Um, but there are reasons to use both. Um, a push pier is gonna be installed on, on an existing structure. New construction, a helical pier could be used. So the push pier system, picture that we saw, saw before, it goes down until it hits bedrock. That's kind of what the bracket looks like. These are what the sections are like, three foot sections and they fit male and female inside one another. And then the helical pier, screwed in, ideal for new construction and um, or for maybe lighter structures because it does not use the weight of the structure to install. That push pier will actually hook underneath the house and use the weight of that home to push those piers in. So there's a few little before and after pictures. Um, so this is something you might see on a brick home. See some zigzagging going on there. That's after you can see it's all closed. Still leaves some a little bit of <laughs> gap in there. Stucco, like I said, a lot of times that stucco will stretch. Uh, I know a lot of times people will see their home, see a lot of cracking stucco. If you don't have any sort of indication on the inside of the home that there's a problem, it's probably just a bad stucco job. You'll see that a lot where there's all sorts of cracking and it looks like there's an issue. It's usually, you know, maybe a bad batch of stucco or I don't know, but likely the stucco will stretch quite a bit and will not crack until you start seeing issues inside the home. And so that one, as it's lifted back, you can see it was lifted back and it kind of overlapped where it was originally. So the stairway that was lifted back, to the corner of that same home, and then it's down maybe an inch or three quarters of an inch and it was lifted back. So it's got some. So here was a home. This was in West Valley. Any, anybody know where that Balmoral community is in? West Valley? So this was a home that, you can see the clouds, this is a time lapse of a home that was actually lifted back up and stabilized. You kind of, if you look right here, you can see that close up. So you can see there's a rain gutter there, there's still a little bit of a gap, and it's just with those hydraulics lifting that home back, it's actually um, a row of townhomes. And so this townhome and then the adjoining one is separated. And it kind of snapped like maybe like the Titanic where the end of it had broken and it was lifted back up to close that gap there. So, and that was probably, I think that was over maybe, maybe an hour, hour and a half of lifting that up. That's that time lapse right there. So, 
with the units per ride at end unit or interior? So this this is the end unit here. And then I think there was maybe four or five units, and then just this one end unit for some reason. Um, the soil, I, it was right, it's actually pretty near some uh, pretty swampy area, water table issues. And so um, this was not the only one. There was actually five others, but the very end unit broke off just like that. And so. Seems like I heard that the, the uh, condo association was responsible for that. Yeah, and that's um, right. You guys all know condo HOA, the difference. So yeah, usually if it's a condo, they probably would. HOA on a uh, like a townhome, usually it wouldn't. I mean, it all depends, right? We've we've seen, I've seen all the <coughs> covered. It comes on the bylaws. That one though, I think was the it was a condo association. I'm I'm not sure if it's those same ones, but yeah, you can see in this bedroom here, you can see daylight. I mean, you can see all the framing here. I think I let it run for a second or so, so it's harder to see, but you can see daylight in this bedroom. I mean, it's just the whole thing is pulled apart. And so, see that thing you lifted back up into place there. How permanent is the uh, lift repair? Um, that is considered a permanent fix. Um, the steel that is used will, since it does go down to bedrock, it's Consideration is that it, it's going to be more firm than an actual foundation because it's not relying on on that soil that can be compromised by water, and so yeah, it's it's a permanent fix. It's not something that's temporary, and it's true. I mean, whatever was written into that house that was sold or that house that was listed, usually you're not going to see that there's piers on the house. You usually won't know or see that anything was done or, or altered on the home at all. It's all below the surface. So I think this is from inside that home that we pushed back together. <clears throat> How do you think this may affect the sales? I mean, if you, with your buyers and sellers, I mean, would this have a large impact on being able to sell the home? Probably most of them. Yeah, likely, huh? Oops. Any questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Ross, when you go in and you do those foundation repairs, actually, I think you may have been on that on one of our listings that we have at one point, but what kind of a guarantee do you offer on? Yeah, so a lot of a lot of people will offer. I know there's companies that do like 25, 10 year, 25 year guarantees, 30 years, or 30 years. There's some. I think there might even be some that are like a lifetime warranty on it. Um, but yeah, there's, it, and it stays with the home. You know, I mean, the idea is that when you go and, and you help these people buy and sell their homes, that you you know I, I understand you're not home inspectors, but so you go out and you understand what to look for maybe some, some signs, or if the home was repaired, you know, what to look for and what, what the cost may be that were involved with it, the warranty, things like that. So, certainly. Yeah, if you're, if you're listing a home that hasn't been repaired, you know what's required to be disclosed? Um, so since we're not the seller, um, the seller would, you know, you know your, your laws more than me, but I would imagine the seller would disclose that yes, there was a repair that was done. Did anybody answer that? Well, if, if it was that seller, <laughs> it may have been a previous owner that yeah. had it done and he may not even know about it. That's the dangerous part. So like if um, if one person had the work done and then they sold it, they disclosed it, and somebody bought it, well now that person is selling it? Yeah. Do they no longer have to disclose? Or do no. they if they know about it, they have to they disclose. They know about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. So if they even if they didn't have the work done, but they know you know, through whatever grapevine or whatever that there was work done, they need to disclose that. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Ross, I did have one other question. Since I've heard once that horizontal cracks were more of a concern than Good vertical. question. Um, actually, it's more of the opposite. So okay. when you see horizontal cracking, have you ever seen horizontal <coughs> cracking on foundation walls? 
where um, you know maybe maybe you'll see some of the rebar that's popped out on it. Anybody seen that? So typically, what that is is that can be the placement of that rebar. Okay, we've got an eight-inch thick foundation wall. Right in the middle of that, we should have rebar. Well, that doesn't always happen. So sometimes we will get that rebar closer to the edge, and so that freeze-thaw cycle will cause some of that to pop off at times. Many times it'll be just a cosmetic issue, and it can just be patched. But what what we're looking for, and as I mentioned before, we're looking for other compensating factors. <clears throat> and so homes that we have looked at, it's never just one thing. It's never just zigzagging into brick like this that we saw. It's, it's not just that. There's always, there's gonna be zigzagging into brick and on the opposite side, popping in the drywall. There's gonna be a nearby door where you're seeing that zigzagging, uh, a door that does not close like it should. Or, or um, you know, horizontal crack in, in, the, in the foundation wall that's near that area as well. Is there a rule of thumb, like if you go into a basement and you see a crack, and you're like, okay, that crack is not, you don't have to worry about it, but if it's a different size, you would, like, how would? Good question, yeah. So the way that we will measure a foundation is we use a, a laser transit or a laser level that will shine a nice, even beam. You can actually see it in one of those videos. It shines a nice, even laser beam, and we measure from that beam to either the floor or the ceiling. Now, if you have vaulted ceilings, we don't measure to the ceiling, but we'll measure to that nice level floor. And when we measure, we're looking for, we say a half inch, a half inch or less is usually within that realm of, you know, the margin of error. Because, you know, nobody's perfect, but most homes are really dead on. They really are. And so when you measure, when we start seeing things greater than a half inch, sometimes we will discount those and say, well, maybe the, maybe it was built this way. But if we see you know, greater than a half inch and it was built that way, we shouldn't see any cracks, right? We shouldn't see anything like that. But if we do, and then we start seeing cracking, and we start seeing doors and windows that don't open, and then we start seeing you know, vertical cracks in the foundation, nail pops, then we know we've, we've got a, a problem. And so a lot of people will say, well, I'm sure the settling is, is soft, right? You know, and that's, everybody will ask that. Like, it, it's done settling. And after this class, hopefully you kind of know the answer, right? What's the answer to that? I don't know. Yeah, we don't know because we could have major rainstorm. We could have little Timmy leave the hose on for three hours or four hours and dump water at the corner of the house. And the next morning you see, oh my gosh, I've got all these issues. Right? And so we don't know, and the seller is always going to tell you what? It's done settling. Right? Oh, yeah, it settled like 20 years ago, it hasn't moved since. It might, it might be true, it might be right, it could have settled, when was that rain, 82? Didn't we have a lot of rain back then or something? So it could have settled in an isolated instance where like the hose was left on and they went out of town for two weeks or something. And yeah, you come back, you're gonna start seeing things crack on the inside of the house because you've saturated that bearing strata. You know, hard compacted dirt holding up a house versus mud. It's not gonna hold up a house very well. And so, yeah, the, the answer is we don't know. I don't know if it's done settling. Could it continue to settle. Maybe, maybe let's patch it and see if it doesn't move anymore. So. I saw the <clears throat> tri level out in Clinton where the ground level, you know, the main entrance came in up above ground level and they had a basement on that side, but the ground level piece on this side, the foundation around that uh, part of the house was intact, but the entire subfloor had dropped about that far. Hmm. It settled about that much, probably a rebar. Yeah, it yeah, doweled into the foundation. I see that one But the lot. buyer, went ahead and, and bought it after having an engineer come out and look at it. Yeah. The engineer said it's probably just a no rebar, not yeah. enough rebar in there. Yeah. It's probably, probably settled now. He fixed the cosmetic issues and yeah. bought the house. Yeah. Fix a lot of those. They can be fixed easy. So but yeah, sometimes you gotta roll the dice if you're yeah. right. It surprised me. I, yeah. I don't know if I would have. Questions, concerns? Would the fix on an interior footing generally be the same as what you were showing on the yes. exterior one? 
same thing. So I should bring pictures for that on the next one. So, very good. If you want to take a break, we're done with our first hour. We come back here a few minutes after the hour and we'll jump into the second one. <laughs>